So let's look at a simple regression problem. We have got some x's and some y's. These x's are going to be, let's say, I'll mark them here so they're easy to see. All right, we've got, let's say, I don't know, six of them, something like that. And we are going to look at a linear model. So we're going to try to learn a linear model that best fits this data. And then yes, I know that there are formula we can use to figure out what the best model is, but we're gonna actually be using our machine learning gradient descent approach to learn this. So let's look at our diagram. So we have f, and we know the format of f. f is going to be some mx plus b, right? because we said it's a line. So we have coming in here a theta. For a linear model, what is theta? Well, right, if we look at mx plus b, what are the parameters or weights? m and b. So theta is the combination of m and b for a linear model. So we've got our mx plus b coming in here. We know we also have an x coming in. Then y goes down into a loss function. And of course, coming out of f is y hat. So to begin with, we've got a random theta, right? Let's say, for example, our theta is something like, I don't know, this. So uh, we've got a B of, I don't even know what these units are. Let's call this one, two, three, four, five. So our B is, let's say, one to begin with, and our M is, uh, we've got, let's say, one, two, three, four, five, rise over run is about, let's say, five. Okay. These are just numbers we picked randomly. Okay. We got a random theta. And then we're going to try to be analyzing what our loss is with this particular theta, and then adjusting the theta to be better. So what might we use for a loss function? That is, how could we decide how good or bad this particular estimate is. So what do we know? We know, let's say, if we looked at particular xy pairs, so for instance, this xy pair, this is really pretty close. This is a very small loss, whereas let's say this one is a very large loss. What makes sense is probably to go ahead and just look at this distance here. So we look at the distance from here to here and look at that delta. And that gives us uh, an idea of how much loss we have for this instance, this instance, this, 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 and this. Of course, the problem there is in some cases, we may have an x below the line. Like, let's just change this one and make this x below the line. So if we were just doing a delta here of, let's say, uh, f of x minus x, that is, this line minus the value, this would be negative, 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 positive, negative. We certainly don't really want these to cancel out. So we need to somehow probably get rid of the sign. So why don't we say that the loss for a given x and y is equal to f of x, which is just y hat, right, minus y. We could take the absolute value. We could also square it. And let's just say it's squared. So for a given training instance, a given xy pair, then we just look at the distance is squared. And that, of course, gets rid of the negative sign. Now, that's for a single pair. What if we want to look at all of the training instances. 
So uh, I'm going to uh, call that, let's say, the overall loss. So L bar of the training set, the training data set. Well, do we want to just sum up the individual Ls? So this is for x, y in the training set. I would tend to say no. And here's why. Let's say we ignore this particular value. So now we just have these five values. We have a loss, which is the sum of all these. And now we have this sixth training instance, which is a very small loss. Should the overall loss go up or go down? If we just sum them, it's going to go up, which doesn't really make sense. So I would tend to say we want to have the average uh, loss here. So we'll divide by the size of the training data set. That is, it's just equal to the average L of x, y. So that's how we're going to define our loss function. So we have our f equals mx plus b. Our loss function is going to be average f of x minus y squared. Okay. So notice, we are determining we're deciding the f here. We are also deciding the loss function that we want to use. Let's look at the loss for this particular example. So let's create a chart here for these six instances. So let's come up, or rather a table. So we're going to have x, y, y hat, and l. So this one here we're going to call 1, 1, 2, 3, 5. And this one is 2, 4. And this one is, let's say, 3, 4, 2, 4, 3, 4, 4, 3, 5, 1, and 6, 2. Okay, so these are all of our training instances. The x's just happen to have this nice behavior that they're 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So if we look at y hat now, y hat says this is just f of x. So f of 1 is mx plus b, right? So that's 5x plus b, so that's 6. 5x plus b, that makes no sense, of course, because m is rise over run. So m is not 5, m is 1 fifth. Pardon me for that mistake. So thus, y hat here is 1 fifth plus 4. 5. Sorry. 1 fifth plus 1. So 1 1.2. 2 fifths plus 1. So 1 1.4, 1.6, 1.8. 1 Let's just make sure this one is 2.0 and 2.2. Which makes sense. It's going up by a line, so these are going up by even values. Now, if we look at our loss, our loss is 5 minus 1.2 squared, 4 minus 1.4 squared. How do we get to 4 minus 1.4? But because we're doing y minus y hat. Now, this actually says f of x minus y squared, uh, and that's because the difference, it, the difference doesn't matter given that we're squaring it. So officially, this could really be 1.2 minus 5 squared, 1.4 minus 4 squared, but I'll do it this way because it's a little easier. Um, this is 4 minus 1.6 squared, 3 minus 1.8 squared, 1 minus 2 squared. Notice this one is different because this is the one that's below the line. And then finally, uh, 2 minus 2 squared. So according to the way we've come up with these, this blue is actually right on the screen line. So our loss is equal 0. 1. Uh, this is 1.2, so about 1.4. This is 2.4. We'll call this 5.5. Uh, again, this is 
definitely approximately. Uh, 2.6 squared is about, uh, what, let's say 6.5, and this is 3.8, so 3.8 is close to 4, um, so we'll call this, I don't know, 15. And then the average, I'm going to just say it is around 2, 4, 8, 14, 5, 29, 30 divided by 6 is around 5. These numbers may not be uh, completely accurate. They're rough ballpark approximations. So we have an average loss of 5. What do we do with this? Well, now, remember, we take this loss and feed it in an optimization function. So let's go ahead and just keep this last value, that the average loss is 5. Okay, so we're going to feed the loss now to the optimizer. The optimizer's job is to update our function to be better, to reduce the loss. How does it do that? Again, what it does is it adjusts theta. So it makes a change to theta. It does not change the form of f. So f is still mx plus b. All that we do is change these theta. And again, a reminder that theta these are called parameters, or they may also be called weights. We'll see why when we get farther into neural networks and uh, matrices and so on, but those are commonly, commonly also called weights. So those are our parameters. Theta, of course, we're not choosing theta. We're choosing the function. We're choosing the loss function. We're going to also choose the optimizer to use. We may be involved in coming up with x and y. I would write and say we exactly choose it, though. We definitely do not choose theta. Instead, this whole learning process is trying to come up with a good value for theta. And what we're looking at here right now is one cycle through this. So one cycle of taking x and y, or in this case, some x's and y's, feeding them through f, getting y hats, coming up with a loss. Again, our loss is 5 and then coming into an optimizer. So we're going to decide what to do with an optimizer in a moment. First question we might look at is, if I actually just look at this, right, I can see this graph. I can see all of the data points in the training data set, and I can see our line. The question is, should B be higher or lower? And I think it's reasonable to say B should be higher, right? If we just move this line up, we would reduce the loss. Should, given we're in this state, all other things being equal, would we increase or decrease the loss by adjusting M? What would happen to M? Well, if we increase M, right, if we left B alone and increased M, this, I think, would give us a better loss than what we have now, and a better loss than if we actually uh, reduced the slope. Because if we reduce the slope, that's increasing the loss for all five of these lines and only reducing it for this one. That's counterintuitive because we know that actually this line, just by looking at it, would be the best line. So this would be a line where we had increased B and also decreased M so that M were now negative. But as far as just making it a, a, a tweak to theta from where we are now, it would seem the best bet would be increase b slightly and also increase m slightly. Over time, as we started increasing b and increasing b and increasing b, once b were up to here, let's say, we would find that it would be better to actually decrease m than decrease m and increase B and decrease M and increase B and decrease B. So we may be going in the wrong direction for a while for as far as optimizing M because we are working in this multivariable situation where we are trying to optimize both B and M. But over time, 
where we should get to the right solution. So, but this determination, this idea of the fact, just by looking at this, we know we want to increase B and increase M in order to immediately reduce the loss. The problem is we don't have this inside the optimizer. We don't have this picture. All we have is the loss function. And so how do we decide how to adjust B? Here's one thing we could do. We could take our loss, given our current B and M, our current data, and then we could increase B slightly, run it through again, recalculate the loss, and see what happens. Then we could decrease B slightly, run it through the loss function, figure out what the loss is, see whether it's higher or lower. Let's just look at an example here. I'm going to make up some numbers. But let's say B is 1, M is 1 fifth. And if we now said let's increase B slightly, let's make B be 1.001, M equals 1 fifth. Let's make B equal 0.999, M equals 1 fifth. Well, here, the average loss would be, if we decrease B, slightly higher. So it would be 5 point something. I don't know what that something is. 5 point something. If we increase B, we know the loss will go down slightly. And so we know that the average loss will equal 4.9 something. So this is a straightforward way to tell us that if we go a little bit in the direction of increasing B, we will decrease the loss. Similarly, we can do a, we can leave B alone and modify M slightly and see what would happen if we decrease M a little bit, what would happen if we increase M a little bit. And that works. And that is a potential optimizer you could write. The problem is it's terribly expensive because depending on the size of theta, that is the number of parameters that there are, that means we have to do however many parameters there are, calculate the loss twice for each one. So if we have, and this is certainly fairly common, 100 million parameters, that would mean we would need to go through and calculate this loss function 200 million times. And it's just absurdly slow. So we are not going to use this numerical approach here. Instead, we're going to use an analytical approach. What we're going to do, let's, let, let's look at a graph. We're going to end up with the same result. We're going to end up with a result that says we do want to increase B. And we're going to end up with a result that says we do want to increase M. And I am going to just store this 5 here. All right, so I'd like to look at a graph of the loss versus B. So let's look at a graph, average loss, versus B. We know right now that B is 1, and we know the loss is 5. We also know that if we were to decrease B, the loss would increase. And we would know if we were to increase B, and then we know this just by looking at this chart. So we know if we were to decrease B, the loss, we know that if we were to increase B, that is make this line go up, the loss would go down. The loss would probably be minimized somewhere around, I'm going to guess here maybe. So I'm going to just say it's at B equals 3. So that's where we'd be our lowest loss. I have no idea what the absolute va the, the actual value of it, let's just say it's there. And I also know that if we were to continue to increase B after that, the loss would rise. So I'm claiming we have some sort of a function that looks like this, where we are mapping the value of B to the average loss. If we had this, if we knew the graph, we could just directly go to the zero point, but we, we don't necessarily have this. What we have is this point here, right? This is what we know. We know that when b is 1, which it currently is, that our average loss is 5. And this assumes we maintain m equals 1 fifth and don't change that. Okay, so we're holding everything else constant and just looking at what happens as we change b, and this is what happens to the loss. 
We know that if we evaluated 1.001, we got a slightly lower loss. And if we evaluate, and when we evaluated 0.9999, we got a slightly higher loss. So that told us that we actually want to go to the right on this graph. But how could we do that without doing those calculations on the loss? Now, let me put a guideline on here. There's a line. And that line touches this graph right at this point, 0.15. In fact, what we can say is that this line is tangent to our loss graph here. Hmm. So it's tangent. So this is actually the slope of the function at b equals 1. If B were over here, right, if we happen to have our line way up here, then the slope would be different. right? Then the slope would look like this. How can we tell just from the slope the direction to go? Well, here we have a positive slope. So the positive slope says if you increase B, the loss will go down. Here, sorry. This is a negative slope. If we increase b, the loss will go down. Here we have a positive slope. If you increase b, the loss will go up. So we can, without even seeing any of the curve, all we have to do is look at this. And all we have to do is actually look at the pink line. right? So if we could calculate that pink line, which is the slope, we could just say, if the slope is positive, I know we want to increase b. If, on the other hand, the slope is negative, I want to decrease b. That's what we're going to do. So what do we need? We need to know how to come up with this slope. Well, that's fairly straightforward. That's just the derivative of the loss, average loss, with respect to b. So as long as this loss function is differentiable with respect to b, that will give us a slope. The slope is going to tell us which direction we want to go. So we don't actually have to go recalculate the loss. All we have to do is calculate the derivative. And so if this is positive, then increase b. Sorry. If it's positive, we're over in this case, and so we want to decrease b. And if it's negative, increase b. And I guess also, if it's zero, we want to leave b alone, because we don't gain any advantage by increasing or decreasing. So that's what we're going to look at. We're going to basically compute the derivative of the average loss with respect to b. And we're also going to compute the derivative of the average loss with respect to n. Now, since f has multiple variables, right? we're looking here at m and b sort of as variables in this case, this is actually not d average loss divided by db and d average loss divided by dm. It's actually the partial derivative. So let's just make sort of that change here. This is partial average loss over partial b, partial average loss over partial m. There's no real particular difference needed other than just the fact it's doing a partial derivative instead of a complete derivative. So, uh, let's look and see how we're going to do this. How we're going to make, going to calculate the partial derivative of the average loss divided by the partial derivative of b. Well, we know the average loss is the average of the individual losses for each of these data instances. So and in that case then the derivative is just going to be the average derivative. So this is really just going to be the average of the derivative of L for a particular XY with respect to B. So this is the average over x's and y's. 
Now, how do we calculate the partial derivative of L? Well, we know L is of the form of f of x minus y. We can actually rewrite this, right, just using the chain rule. So the average over x and y, the derivative of L, so given x, y, partial derivative of L over partial of f times the partial of f over the partial of e. Well, let's go ahead and look at the simpler one, partial f with respect to partial b. So we've got f equals mx plus b. If we want to take the partial derivative of f with respect to b, we basically treat everything except b as a constant. So m and x are constants. So therefore, the derivative of a constant is just 0. We've got just the derivative of b, which equals 1. Similarly, partial f over partial m, x and b are constants. So the derivative of b is 0. mx, the derivative of that, given that x is a constant, is just x. So that takes care of this last term here. Now we just need to look at the derivative of l, partial l, with partial l over partial f. So what do we know? We know l equals f of x minus y squared. So if we take the derivative, that equals, well, this is, again, using the chain rule. So 2 times f of x minus y. One thing to note before we get rid of this chart is that this chart is the average loss for b given the data set and uh, fixed in. That is, so this is for m equals one fifth. If we were to change the value of m, then this function may change, right? It may no longer have a minimum at b equals 2. It may completely adjust. Similarly, if we change the data set, this could also be different because the data set controls what the average loss is. So it's dependent on a fixed set of data points and a fixed m. And this is going to change. So as we go through the loop, go through, update our theta, now all of a sudden our loss function is going to be different and this particular picture would be different, which means we're going to have different slopes. This idea of going and deciding that we are going to take a small step in the direction of decreasing the loss for b and separately a small, small step for m is called gradient descent. Here's one way to think of it. Let's say you're on a mountain and you want to get off the mountain, you want to get to the bottom, down in the valley. But it is extremely foggy. You can't see a foot in front of you and you want to know which direction to go. Well, what you might do is first, in sort of the north-south direction, using you do have a compass course. So in the north-south direction, you look and you say, we're going north, take me lower, or we're going south, take me lower. So your plan is going to be go down. Okay, so that is your command, go down. So you go in the north or south direction, it'll take you down, and the east or west direction will take you down. So let's think of B as sort of the north-south. So we're going to independently look and say if we go north or if we go south, a small amount, does that go down? Okay, we choose which way. Let's say it's north. And then we choose an N, which is we're going to think of as east-west. So now we go east-west and we say, does east go down or does west go down? Let's say it's west. Well, we decided north goes down and west goes down, so we'll proceed in a northwest direction. And we just keep doing that. That's the idea. There are problems, of course. One problem is you might get stuck in a local minimum, right? You might have, if I look in the one-dimensional, so the two-dimensional case, uh, so you might have, let's say, you're starting up here, and you're trying to get down to here, but you get in this local minimum. And when we're down here, going left goes up, and going right goes up, so therefore you think you got it. So we will deal with that. Uh, it turns out in neural networks, we don't often get stuck in local minima. Okay, there are, we 
We don't exactly know why. Uh, one potential reason is that we have many, many, many parameters, and so there's always some parameter choice that is going to take us lower uh, than where we are. Uh, another possibility is we may have multiple local minima, but they may all be sort of at the same relative height. Okay. So that's the gradient descent we're going to do. We're going to go down. And we're going to have some ways of trying to deal with getting out of these local minima, but we're not doing that right now. All right, so let's look at our chart. So our chart, again, has x, y, y hat, and then we're going to look at uh, partial L, partial B, partial L, partial M. And again, these were 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 2, 4, 3, 4, 4, 3, 5, 1, and 6, 2. y hat, uh, again this was let's say 1.2, 1 1.4, 1 1.6, 1 1.8, 1 2.0, 2.2. 2 .2. So I think in my previous chart I actually showed this as 2.0 and that was wrong. Oh well. And now let's compute partial L, partial B. So partial L, partial B is partial L, partial F, which is 2 times y hat minus y. So y hat minus y is uh, so it's negative 3.8 times 2 is negative, let's add another column here. So 2 times y hat minus y is negative 3.8, negative uh, 7.6. This is negative 2.6, so negative 5.2. This is 1.6 minus 4, so that's 2.4, so negative 4.8. Uh, negative 1.2, so negative 2.4. Uh, negative 1, so that's negative, sorry, positive 1. So that's a positive 2. And negative 0.2, so negative 0 0.4. We know the partial derivative of f with respect to b is 1. So therefore, we just take this and multiply it by 1. I can do that probably without any errors. And partial derivative of L with respect to M is X. Sorry, partial derivative of F with respect to M is X. So we need to multiply this, which is this, 2 times F of X minus Y times X. So we're going to multiply negative 7.6 times X. Well, we get another 7.6. Negative 5.2 times x, negative 10.4. Negative 4.8 times 3, so that would be negative 15, negative 14.4. Negative 2.4 times 4, so that's negative 9.6. Negative 2 times 5, so that's negative 10. And negative 0 0.4 times 6, which is negative 2. Point, sorry. One of these is supposed to be positive. So that was a positive 2, positive 2, positive 10. And then this one is a negative 0 0.4 times 6, so that's a negative 2.4. So now let's look at the averages. Our average loss with respect to B is about, let's just say, negative 12, negative 16, negative 18, negative 19, negative 17, about negative 17 divided by 6. So let's just say about a negative 2.9. Yeah, it's very rough. Here, negative 18, negative 32.4, negative 33, negative 42, negative 32, negative 34, um, divided by 6, so that's about negative 5.8. So basically what we've now done is, for B, we've determined the slope. So the slope is negative. And so therefore, we're going to be increasing B in order to decrease the loss. For M, we've decided also the slope is negative. In fact, it's a uh, more extreme negative. And so we are going to, again, increase M in order to decrease the loss. So this is what we've done in the optimizer. In the optimizer, we've actually calculated these two numbers. 
So this is in the optimal zone. So we've calculated a gradient. A gradient, officially, is really just a vector or matrix of partial derivatives. So the gradient is equal partial f with respect to partial b and partial f with respect to partial m. So we always are going to be calculating the gradient in the optimizer, and this is the, the gradient. We're going to be computing this matrix because we're going to actually eventually be using the graphical processing unit, which does fancy matrix uh, arithmetic very fast in order to compute this simultaneously, so, so to speak. All right, we have got our gradient. Oftentimes in neural networks, uh, we really just talk about the gradient to mean the various derivatives, the various slopes. So rather than this gradient, which is officially, right, these partial derivatives, instead of being values, are actually functions. So officially, the gradient is a matrix of derivative functions. Often, we are going to talk about the gradient to mean the matrix of uh, derivative values of actual slopes. All right, so let's go ahead and decide how we're going to actually adjust theta. Right? That's our job of an optimizer. We've got this gradient, okay? these slopes for the loss with respect to b and the loss with respect to m. We know the direction we want to go. Here's a potential. Right? What we could say is we're going to go ahead. This is adjusting theta. So it's part of the optimizer. We could say, OK, let's go ahead and set b equals b. I'm going to say minus negative 2.9. So we're actually not going to just look at the direction of the gradient. We're going to look at the uh, magnitude as well. So not just the sign, but the magnitude. And we'll say, if we've got a shallow gradient, we'll go a little bit. And if we've got a steep gradient, we'll, we'll move a lot. So we could say b equals b minus 2.9 and m equals m minus negative 5.8. Right. Both of these have the effect of increasing B and increasing M. The problem is we're not doing baby steps. So the optimizer should be adjusting theta use, using baby steps. So don't make huge changes, make small changes. If we make huge changes, we're going to be in a big problem. Right? If we adjust b by 3, we will have overshot. If we adjust m by 5.8, right, it's now 1 fifth. Now it's going to be something like this. Oh my gosh, that's way, way, way too much. If you think of it, it's as if we're over here, and now we're saying instead of taking a small step you know, from here down to here, we're going to take a giant step you know, over to here, let's say, and we're way over there. And this is going to, I mean, it's great to skipping over this uh, local minimum, that's fine, but we have other problems. So we're going to probably on our next turn, we maybe go back, you know, this way and then this way. We're going to just never move ourselves down into here. So our fix is that we are going to add lambda. Lambda is our learning rate. That's what it's called. And this is part, by the way, of what has made neural nets work over time is learning how to, for instance, have a learning rate. So the learning rate, we might make it, let's say, 0 0.001. This is a value that you get to decide. So among other choices, what universe f is from, what the loss function is, what the optimizer is that we're just deciding right now. Within the optimizer, we also have the choice of what learning rate do we want to use. This is called a hyperparameter. So it's not a parameter, because remember, theta is called parameters. Thetas are the things that we are learning, and this is not something that we are learning. Instead, this is a value we're using trying to control the whole learning process.
it's uh, an art and a technique to figure out these learning rates. It's possible, for instance, to change your learning rate over time. It's called a learning rate schedule. So you might, would you want to have a large learning rate or a small learning rate to begin with? Probably a large learning rate to begin with will let you skip over lots of these things, and then a smaller learning rate could allow you to slowly move your way down to what we hope is a global minimum, or a reasonable local minimum. So that's a learning rate. Let's just use this learning rate and see what happens to our new B and our new M. So what we're going to do is we're going to say B equals B minus lambda, negative 2.9, M equals M minus lambda, negative 5.8, again, where these came about by looking at the gradient of the overall loss with respect to B and M, respectively. So we're going to say B is B minus 0 0.001 times negative 2.9. So negative 2.9, we move, what, 3, 1, 2, 3. So B is now going to be equal to 1.0001. Oh, oh, two, nine. And M is going to be 1.0058. So we've slightly increased B. We've slightly increased M. That's one step through this process. And now we go ahead and do it. In fact, what that is called is an epoch. An epoch. So it's a training loop. through all the training instances. And in this case, we did all the instances at once. We took all the instances, we calculated the overall loss, we came up with the B and the M, and then we updated. So this code, this is our optimizer. We calculate the gradient, which is this negative 2.9 Eight, and then we update these. There are lots of different choices of optimizers. This is a sort of a fairly uh, traditional one. Um, and there are others that will do things like adjust the learning rate on a per parameter basis. So if we have been going in the same direction for a long period of time, if we look at the history of our gradients, then we'll make bigger and bigger steps. If it turns out we've been switching back and forth between increasing and lowering and increasing and lowering, then we use smaller learning rates. Okay, there are learning rates that have momentum that say, well, there are all sorts of them. We're going to be looking at all those over, over the next uh, coming lectures. And again, we're going to be looking at all of this sticking still within a polynomial domain where we learn all about loss functions, all about optimizers, all about uh, classifiers, uh, figuring out what y hat is, and those sorts of things before we then move into using neural networks. Because we have so much intuition when we're dealing with polynomials. And intuition tends to go out the window when we're looking at neural networks. So it's much easier to learn all these things uh, in the polynomial space.